So this is a very important minute for me, for it really marks. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, so time for the <laughs> for the live demo. Now it really marks uh, the end of a very intensive period with a lot of work, a lot of investment, illusions, disillusions back to hope, and so on. So uh, it's obviously, uh, I'm here alone on stage, but I would like really to include uh, my two colleagues here who, who were the, the main engines. Not that I am comparing you to machines, but one is here, plop. And the other one might be having a beer somewhere. I can't see him. Yeah, top. Yes, and uh, I will talk about the, this FIFO 7 with uh, the main emphasis being the, the these milest milestones in flexible mesh groundwater modeling. We are uh, about to close this conference, but it's also the, the end of uh, a release cycle uh, that we call alpha entry phase. We are soon about to enter the beta entry phase, so that's about the mic powered by DHI uh, release 2000, 2016, for which we have a, a big increment, a big step in the, in the versioning. Yeah, so for 20 to half an hour, 20 minutes to half an hour, I will speak around those three topics. I will first start to give you a few informations about the motivations behind the, the work. We, we started about 3D and structured meshing, and, uh, and then I will definitely show you what will be released soon. I will focus on the three main workflows we've been developing. And of course, this is the big title, but uh, we have also several new features that deal with uh, processes, numerical methods and solvers, and also the user interface. So what, for us, what were the, the main motivations behind uh, developments related to 3D and structural meshing? I would say first, and I, will, I would really rank first the, the notion of pleasure in terms of new development ch challenges. Uh, I think this is anyways fundamental for a developer to, to have fun, just, just fun in developing and entering or facing new challenges and going through it. And I think it's really a, a big boundary condition with a very low level of uncertainty on the outcome and the quality of the product. So that's why I really put it or rank it first. But uh, the good thing is that uh, on top of that, it also opens the door to new types of applications. More flexibility in meshing means, uh, of course, more flexibility in honoring uh, the geological data, if available. But we are also now more flexible, probably, to deal with uh, geotechnical problems, definition of structures, meshing of structures. Would it be uh, subsurface, underground storage, refinement around, around whales? We had a presentation today dealing with this. It's, uh, anyways, it's a problem in many cases. And being able to, to break the, the legacy or the, the, the layered mesh approach and go full 3D, full and structured. So a few words about uh, the standard approach of FIFLO and actually many, most of the codes, the 3D codes, that is the, the, the layered prism-based finite element meshes. Of course, it has the full flexibility in 2D. It is extruded to 3D. And it has a lot of advantages in uh, building up models. It's pretty easy. It's also easy to develop methods for selection, assignment. So the process, the pre and post process of the data is 
by itself way more easy, easier using this type of approach and it covers anyways and will still cover a, a very wide range of applications. We are not saying bye-bye to this, we are just adding flexibility to this approach. But, on the other hand, of course, and this is uh, something that, this is a work of this man here, Yung Feng, it implies for complex situations a lot of work, uh, extremely, extremely big amount of hours and days to be able to reproduce such, such ge geometries. And today, hopefully, we are about to provide something which will facilitate your life and the life of, of others. But in 2D, whether you use triangle or any kind of generator, you often see that it can fail. It's not, it's not an obvious task even to mesh in 2D, so to mesh triangles or tetrahedrons in 3D also is a difficult task which may and will end up with failures, difficulties, retrials and so on. Uh, I don't know if it's still valid, but uh, a long time ago I had read in a mathematical article that uh, to mesh a ball with tets has not a unique solution or can fail. You're not sure, you're not, you're not sure that you will always end up with a fully filled volume. So just to say that it's not one, but this ball here, I was meshing it every day and it worked. So <laughs> I'm kind of still full of hope. The flexibility was, up to some extent, already there, uh, although a bit hidden, in FIFLO 6.2. So we still had the layered uh, meshes, but each slice could have different x, y, or each node of each slice could have different x, y coordinates. And this was motivated by uh, actually PNG and the diapers and the works of Vladimir Mirny to accommodate the swelling in, uh, in, in a mesh which will grow and, and swell by itself. So that was the first, uh, first level of flexibility, but we had no real tools to, to really uh, uh, make it usable. But now, and you will see it soon, we are really fully unstructured in the 3D space and what what are the implications for us? Well, of course, it has really been uh, a revolution. We had to go through, you can guess, a series of steps. The entire code or most of the code, would it be the visualization parts or the calculation parts, were, of course, relying on this addressing from the 2D information down to the 3D information. So most of the code or most of the parts or the, the, the thematic parts of the code had to be touched. So it was a lot of time dedicated to that and also to make it converge towards uh, the solutions we have today. So of course the first thing for which Hans Jörg has been, has been of Great help was to first adapt the calculation capacities, capabilities to the different types of elements. These are, this is now the, the family or the topology of elements we are supporting and mixing. Visualis visualization, of course, had to be adapted. And of course, we had to think of some workflows and machine strategies to define them and then to set them in place. I will enter in the, very soon in, in the details of the three different workflows we had, but one of them is of, is of course using the geological information that may come from different geological modelers, which are becoming more and more popular today. If they used to be very popular for the, the oil industry in the, in the past, today, with the advances of hydrogeological model, we also need to use them. So we did uh, some joint efforts with uh, 
for now four main distributors of geological models. We have the three, we are supporting in terms of interfacing of data, not more than that so far, but we are supporting data coming from 3D GeoModeler, GoCAD, Leapfrog, and uh, the MindSight tool from Hexagon. And quickly, so we are typically importing structural data coming from uh, geological models. So we highly depend on, of course, on the quality of also of, the da of this data. We'll come back to it. We also have had to define a new object for this, the so-called super element mesh, which was 2D so far, because it was the base for the 2D generation of the meshes. Now we have a 3D equivalent, which is the base also for the generation of the 3D meshes. And this one so far is deduced or, or converted from those data we would import from uh, the exports of uh, the four main geological modelers I've mentioned before. So it's typically a set of polygons, like in 2D, but they are distributed in the 3D space. Could be a set of points as well, uh, could be segments. And the particularity here that we will uh, thoroughly extend in the future is that each facet, for example, each little polygon, point, or segment can carry out some information in terms of markers. And this is this information that we carry through the, the process of meshing. So we try at best to bookkeep it so that once we, you have the mesh, you can distribute uh, your par parameters. Because, of course, now being fully unstructured has a lot of implications on how we can dress up the models. We have the mesh, cool, but then we have to dress it up, and it's way more difficult uh, than in 2D, where we would navigate from one slice to the other, use 2D selection methods, 2D assignment methods, etc. You know the standard classification of uh, groups of elements in, in the layer-based FIFLO mesh. So we have the slice and layer concept within which we can make selections of elements and nodes. Once we don't have any more this type of layering, we need still to have some way of classifying the elements, grouping them, so we have this concept of element group, where, for example, here, guess you have a mesh, we could create groups of elements pertaining to, to a given class of, uh, or a given location. And still to be uh, developed further, but we had to, uh, to develop also tools for selection, assignments. Very important in that case, as I said before, the inheritance of parameters and boundary conditions. Okay, I'm progressing slowly. I'm still more or less 2D. This is the new type, so it's a first level of flexibility before going towards the full 3D meshes, but this is a new type of flexibility we have. So we developed some algorithms to convert triangular meshes into quad or X-dominant meshes in 3D. The reason is well, I would just give you an, a reason from a numerical consideration. The quad element or the brick element in 3D is way more robust from a numerical point of view than the triangle itself. The triangle has, for example, constant gradients on quads or bricks. You have non-constant gradients of the properties we are solving for. And starting with, uh, I should have shown it, but starting with a triangular mesh, converting it into a quad dominant mesh, you end up typically with a more or less 70 to 80 percent of uh, more robust elements, and the rest, the, the 20 to 30 percent, are triangles. So the, the technique is simple you take two triangles and you try to merge them. And so you end up with the same number of unknowns, but you have also less elements to assemble. It's also a game. 
So what, what is the, the main strategy for the 3D meshing? Is actually to combine meshes. So we can have full tetrahedric meshes, so fully structured, all, all directions. But we can have also a standard mesh, a legacy FIFLO mesh, which has been perturbed or remeshed locally because you wanted to inject some specific features, would it be an engineering structure, or just a well, or whatever. So we create selections and we remesh using tetrahedrons. So now you will uh, see a problem summary of this type. When you create such objects, you will have mixed element types and you may have hexahedron, hexahedra, triangular prisms, pyramids, and tetrahedra. So as I said, where possible, because the, the old way, which will be, in, which is not an old way, but the, stand, the classical way is, is good anyway, so why not staying with layered meshes where there is no necessity to, to go deeper or, or to increase the complexity, but when, where it's necessary, then you can embed and structure tetrahedral meshes. You can resolve the pinching, that was also a big topic that we wanted to address. So from a layered mesh where currently we need to keep with a very thin or very small thickness, although the geological layer itself is, has disappeared, now we can simplify a bit the life and really pinch, terminate the layers, which is, I think, a big advance. And if you are lucky and have the, the full structural information, so that means you have access to geological modelers, then you can take this and fill the space with tetrahedrons and, and really work with the fully instructed mesh. So the three workflows I will detail a bit more, actually, those ones. Just a few words about the, the tet mesh uh, generation itself. We are using the famous TED-GAN generator, who is uh, developed next door, actually, here in Berlin at the Weierstrass Institute by Hang Zi. Uh, it's a generator that, is, that has become popular. Google is using it. Nobody knows for what, even them, I guess. <laughs> uh, Mathematica has it in... Uh, and uh, some others, and we have it. A big constraint, there's always a constraint, but that's more or less the same one as in 2D for a mesh generator like Triangle, is that the type of data that TEDGEN is expecting is something like that. It's called a piecewise linear complex. It's like the 3D superlinent mesh I was showing before, it's just a set of connected uh, polygons, but they have to be really connected. They cannot intersect like that without any resolution of the intersection. That's, that's a, bit, a big boundary condition. So those uh, geological modelers able to produce structural models by means of discrete surfaces need to ensure this, this type of quality and not this one. It was not a big concern for them because they were mainly in relation to oil industry that used voxel approach in most of the cases. So having a clean, nice structural description of the geological model uh, was not a, a main concern, so it was just for maybe visualization purposes. So they didn't care about doub doublets, about intersections or whatever. But we do care now, and uh, I think they also realize that they should do something about this because we won't be the only ones uh, using extensively their output. So there's already a discussion and work in progress. So it should be just better and improved in, in the future. But it's already possible today. I'm not saying that <laughs> nothing can be done in that direction. That would be a 
an ideal piecewise or PLC. So again, uh, two, two geological bodies and described by surfaces with their own markers. That's fairly easy for Tedgen to mesh such a thing. No problem, but of course this is just the ideal case. Okay, more details now on the, the three main workflows you should experience. The first one is, the starting point is a FIFLA mesh, a standard mesh, layered. But you want to add some particularity, in that case it's a generic model, but it's a caustic, say it's, uh, the intent is to model a caustic uh, network here, uh, that was provided by uh, one of your students, uh, Philippe. Uh, I don't s I'm not sure we can see it well, but here in yellow there is a su succession of uh, pipes, segments, that we add as 3D maps, we import them, and they are used to define zones, so elements, selections of elements to be remeshed, that will be the zone that will be remeshed, and inside this zone we will constrain the machine by the presence of uh, the guilty elements, so those responsible for the remeshing, so those segments, on which we can decide the element length, sizes of the tets, and so on. So, so from, I guess there was nothing there, it was a uniform mesh, we end up with such things, so those, these are the zones that have been remeshed, you can see here the pipes, coming up, and you may already see a conflict there. How do we do that? We have triangles on in one zones, 3D triangles, I mean, t triangles, and we have standard prisms there with uh, quadrangular facets. So we have three nodes against four nodes. They have to be glued, and that's why we are now using pyramids, and they are only used to connect standard parts, so prism-based parts, to full tets zones, a bit like that, because the pyramid has a square base, uh, a base that is squared, and uh, the four remaining facets are triangular. So this is where the tets are glued, and that's how the connection is made between two different types of meshes. Like here, we see a little pyramid that has been cut. Second way of working, so that's the full tetrahedric mesh generation. So this, this is a half synthetic model that was made uh, using the standard functionalities of FIFLO some years ago by uh, Robin Dufour here for those who like hiking the Swiss mountains that should be Matteron yeah that should be Matteron and uh, that's the geological model the 3D geo modeler geologic model and with a lot of work like in your case in fan so, say, manual work, working a lot with the FIFLO GUI, plus potentially some IFM plugging needs to, accommodate, to do some additional operations, you may end up with a parameter distribution within a given mesh that tries to spouse the best it can the, the geological model. And then you solve it. But in a case like that, you already, you, well, first you need a lot of layers. Some of them will become very thin. They may, may create also numerical instabilities. And you end up with uh, quite a lot of elements, like uh, five million elements here. A good amount of nodes as well. So we took, with the new approach, you can take the structural data, so the same starting point actually, but in terms of interfaces in the 3D space. We have now some a window here that is a result of the import, or that's the, a stage of the import of this type of data, and given the content of the data, whether each item of the data has a marker or not, each faces, whether it 
it is marked as something special. It could be a layer interface, fault, whatever. We decide whether we bookmark, bookmark it or not at that stage. We can also join different data, different maps, and potentially try also to merge them to end up with a unique object. This, in that case, that was the data coming from uh, Intrepid, so GeoModeler 3D. So you may, s may see different geological bodies and so on. So it's a triangulation of the interfaces. Same, but uh, with the coloring according to the markers of those interfaces, showing the variation in geology. And this is the result of the meshing. We don't see the mesh so far, but this is a cut here to show that we managed to honor the geology that was carried by the geological model. And this is a cut through the mesh. Of course, when you cut or carve, uh, if you clip the mesh like this, it's a bit hard to, to have a nice visualization of tetrahedrons. It may appear a, a bit fuzzy here, but that's normal. That's the, it's just a, a cut, so you lose a bit the, the feeling of the structure. But if you don't cut and look from the outside, you end up with something like that. And you solve, you do your simulations, and uh, I will show uh, an unfair uh, comparison between the two approaches. The fact here is that we end up with a very small amount of uh, nodes, as opposed to the two million we had before. It will not be always the case. It's not that that meshing gives you less elements. That was uh, just that was just uh, an example case. So if we proceed with this unfair comparison of CPU times, <laughs> we end up with a fully unfair <laughs> result that says that, yeah, in that case, you really have to go with the tetrahedral mesh. We also compare the result. It's not only comparing the run times. So we were comparing something which is comparable in terms of uh, results. And uh, luckily, we had a uh, a very such a difference in uh, number of nodes that uh, was a big gain. Okay, and the last workflow we have is uh, to perform such things. So for that, we have extended the, this layer configurator that you probably know very well. In order to break uh, the big constraint we had on the continuity of those layers, but you can do it through uh, extended or modified version of the layer configurator. So you shall not be too lost at the beginning. Carlos and uh, Eric will uh, do a live demo afterwards, so you will see in more details what it is. The approach is simple. You start. So it's a bit like before for complex geological model, you had to think of, okay, how many geological layers I have, how many numerical layers I tend to use, and then I have those faulting throws, and what do I have to do? How many slices at the end I have to work with? Those who would truly represent uh, differences in terms of geology and those who would be there to accommodate uh, the variations of the elevations of each slice and so on. So the, the approach is more or less the same, but now we allow the pinching and we actually start, you will start to define the number of layers you need, number of slices, a bit like before, but now you know that you can pinch it. And now, the 3D layer configurator is fully dynamic. You can interact with the maps, with the elevation data you may have. I will show it a bit later. But the thing is that you, you work as if you would uh, operate with a legacy layered mesh, but you allow the pinching. So they, there is a phase where we fully destroy uh, an existing mesh in terms of it's not a valid finite element mesh anymore because such a prism maybe 
ends up like that, although in that case it would be it would be okay, but and after that, so we work on the elevations, which potentially terminate uh, the layers, and after that we resolve those conflicts by local TEDGEN remeshing. So we end up again with a, potentially a, a mixed or hybrid mesh with uh, zones which are prism-based, as before, and locally we, we resolve by uh, tetrahedral elements, the pinching or the outcropping, the termination of uh, layers and so on. And Carlos will even show more complicated use of such uh, an approach. So, yeah. Prism-based elements typically uh, at those regions far from the particularities, the termination of layers. And those two ones, the tet and the, the connector, the pyramid, are uh, in those regions. Voilà, so you may start, uh, you may have typically one, in many cases we have uh, elevations of surfaces, so a set of x, y points and for which we have different elevations that we would like to use to interpolate and that's what we do currently to change the elevations of a fifth flow slice. We would do more or less the same, so here is a, an example. I had already prepared more or less the layers without taking care of the elevations, like that. It's just a counting how many layers do, do I need. And I have uh, my data set, data set of elevations for each slice. We don't see the inside, but here this is where uh, those, those layers are outcropping. That's where we see the elevation data. And in the new layer configurator here, you may use this data by a drag and drop to modify the elevation of the slices or use the de dedicated locally located uh, tools for that. And you will proceed sequentially. We also provide an automated way to do it, especially if you have hundreds of slices, it can be tedious, but sequentially you will proceed with modifying the elevations of the slices, and you can, in between sequences of operation, change the status of the slice, whether it's fixed, cannot be moved, whether it will move with the rest, with the, the global movement. So in that sense, you'd say, OK, this one is, uh, for example, an erosion surface in geological term, or this one is uh, acting as a discontinuity, etc. So it's a bit a way, actually, of doing some with big limitations, but some kind of geological modeling if you have independent sets of elevations describing different interfaces. That would be the result. Before resolving, we have a, a mesh that is not a finite element mesh anymore, because some elements are nothing, some are fully, fully disappeared, some are partly impinged, but not calculable. So here you can see a bit the pinching, but Potentially the mesh is, is thus invalid and we have to resolve it. So decide the location where we will call TEDGAN and it will, TEDGAN will fill the space and resolve the, the conflicts. So that's the last step here. You have access to parameterization of the TEDGAN remeshing to repair the layers. And if you proceed, you end up with a mixed mesh with uh, prism regions. And here in uh, brown, these are all the zones that have been filled with TETs to resolve the pinching. And uh, here is a representation of uh, those pinched, pinched zones. So here we have combination of pyramids and tetrahedrons and the rest is a standard prism-based mesh. So more flexibility means uh, more, more problems, of course, sometimes, but uh, 
We had also to start uh, extending uh, the tools related to modifying a mesh also, or smoothing a mesh, deleting elements. So before, if you remember, if you were selecting in 2D one element, you had the entire column, of course, that was deleted, so you were really creating a hole. Now you can delete <laughs> indiv individual elements, that's nice. Uh, we can smooth, as before, at the slice level only, or as it used to be, so you do a 2D smoothing and the, the, the movements are propagated in the vertical, or you can do a full 3D smoothing of the mesh, or part of it. And uh, since we, well, opening the, the use of quad elements is also creating troubles because uh, we have difficulties with non-planarities, or so if you start deforming or changing the elevations of uh, quadrangles, you, you generate conflict. So we also have a tool to smooth or improve the non-planarity of those quad elements. Voilà. And uh, since we had a new type of generation, a new generator, we decided to put all the mesh generator into the same area so we can switch between generators and you have different properties or different parameterization of the generators. Well, we did open a lot of doors, but we did open also a lot of doors for further improvements. We need definitely more control on the quality of the input. There is a limit to what we can do. Think of intersecting two surfaces. I guess it would take different... All of us can do that. It's just it's geometry, finding the intersections. That's not a problem. Now you put a third one. It's already a problem. And then the fourth one, put thousands of fractures. It's a terrible quadratic effort to resolve and create the intersections. So if we face uh, input data which are not good, we are currently not really able to improve them. Uh, not that we are stupid, but it's just the problem by itself is a, is a real problem. And there is no library on the market or open source that does that. Actually, if you start looking, it's a harsh problem. But we can expect some improvement on the geological model side. And also, we can develop methods to control a bit more those, this aspect. We have to work on developing further uh, selection and assignment methods, more inheritance. This is important also because we are now really mixing different types of elements, so more diagnosis on mesh quality would be welcome. And we also need to go deeper in developing mesh operations such as refinement, de-refinement. Voilà. Actually, I'm nearly finished, um, and that's good if I see the time. It was um, that was the main title, but uh, on the side we did develop a few new features and functionalities. I think this one is pretty interesting. So we injected anisotropy in the definition of the macro dispersion tensor. This is something that. Yeah, I'm sure you will see the, the advantage of this, especially in uh, salt water or density dependent flow settings where you have uh, strong variations of velocity, where you have mass that tends to cross thin layers, thin numerical layers, but vertically, where uh, in the direction of velocity, the, the longitudinal dispersion will be the same, whatever the direction of velocity. So you, you've probably seen that very often, that you have a thin layer, typically an aquitor, but the mass is going through it because of numerical diffusion and so on. Here we will be, we have a high, a new level of control on that, so we can define directions for longitudinal and transverse. I will not into the details because there are many details. We have an extended, extended uh, business approximation 
where we've included dispersive terms in the in the formulation. Well, this is really seems to be effective where you have strong density differences. So the presence or the absence of the, those terms can make a difference. What else? We have a uh, for variable saturation for so for the Richards equation we have a new option. So that's the control volume finite element methods, which is known to yield way more monotonic solutions of the Richards equation as opposed to the standard Galakin finite element formulation. So we already had, uh, thanks to Hans Dirsch, a lot of options to solve variable saturation and, and the, the problems, the numerical problems induced by this equation. So here is a, a, a new one that may help. We, we have a new SAMG version. We made tests. It's definitely more robust and faster. It has increased parallelization plus some inside graph renumbering schemes to reduce the bandwidth of the matrices, so it goes better. We had to make a, cho a decision on the, and I think it's really important to mention it. We drastically lowered the defaults for the threshold or the termination criterion of the solvers because. With those uncertainty and parameter distribution things, we have way more contrast than before. We have mixed meshes, so more contrast also induced in the in the matrix. We've seen that, uh, thanks to our customers also, that there are problems which really call for a lowered termination criterion. So, yeah. Yeah. With backward compat com compatibility, so your old uh, FEM files will still run with the, the previous uh, norms you have decided, but um, for the new ones, we have uh, lowered drastically the, the stopping criterion tolerance. So, more controls on particle trackers, uh, some scale dependency of uh, random walk and a few new auxiliary parameters, like the fluid density, the condition number, which is uh, already a step to, to give a new type of measure of mesh quality. This is something that uh, gives you uh, the degree of deformation of a given element. So it's, uh, it's a direct message towards uh, whether the mesh is sufficiently well designed for calculation or not. And we have also new features like s descriptive statistics on the most of the parameters. So you can draw hydrograms or percentiles, curves, and so on. And I'm finishing here since we really started to have a, some kind of overburden or overload of the, the GUI, if you remember. Uh, now we have a new panel where we will have or the standard slices and layers or the new types of element groups here. And so we made a separation and we made a panel, a sub panel really dedicated to the selections because it was really, we could, we had the mixture of both of them and a long list. So hopefully <laughs> it will simplify a bit. And with this, I'm really thanking you. And uh, if you have no questions, we will have a live demonstration.